Good evening, everyone. Welcome. We're going to wait probably about another, uh, get about another 45 seconds. We ask that you mute yourself when you come in. And we'll be starting very shortly. All right, let's get started. Well, thank you for joining us this evening and welcome to Rising Coaches, DEI Alliance, Women Empowerment Series. This is the final night of a two night part series we had. Last night was tremendous. Tonight is gonna to be even better. I'm Daryl Jacobs, Executive Director of Rising Coaches DEI Alliance. And before we get started tonight, let me introduce our distinguished panels and moderators. She is currently the Chief Operating Officer at Kennesaw State University, former Director of Athletics at the University of California, Riverside, Tamika Smith-Jones. She is a former Division I and Division II head coach and a motivational speaker and the CEO of Jessica Kern Foundation, Jessica Kern Huff. And our final panelist, she's currently the Director of Athletics at Stony Brook University out of the American East Conference, Sean Hilbron. And for tonight, moderators, She's a WNBA legend and currently the vice president of women's basketball for Rising Coaches DEI Alliance, Kim Hampton. <clears throat> and he is a former division one coach, now serves as vice president of men's basketball for Rising Coaches DEI Alliance, Brian Burton. Now we'll turn it over to Kim Hampton who will provide you an overview of tonight's seminar. Kim. Thank you, Daryl. Thank you. I just wanna say welcome everyone and thank you for coming back or just joining us for round two of this women's empowerment series. Um, as Daryl mentioned last night, it was a, an awesome night. It was filled with a ton of great information. And so we are super excited to uh, kick off this evening. Um, the purpose of this initiative is to create change by providing minority and or women coaches the opportunity to finally get answers to those questions that could potentially change their careers. So again, we have a fantastic panel and a panel that has actually been very, very successful in navigating the coaching and administrative arenas. So make sure you use them this evening. They are here for you. Ask those tough questions, those questions that you always wanted answers to. And so with that, I'm going to kick it over to Mr. Brian Burton, Vice President of Men's Basketball. Thank you, Kim. Uh, the order of the evening will kind of go in three rounds. We'll have three moderated rounds, excuse me, four rounds. We'll have three moderated rounds from myself and Kim. Uh, we'll ask the moderators questions. Uh, moderators, feel free if there's another question that was asked to someone else and you feel like you have something valuable to add, please feel free to jump in if you want to after they're finished. And then round four, we'll open it up to the audience to either raise their hand on the uh, Zoom button that you can push or um, just kind of let one of us know through an instant message or in the chat that you want to have that you have a question. And we'll make sure to get to everyone's question. I think one of the biggest things from last night is uh, be fearless to ask your questions. You have this awesome access to um, just these very powerful people in our industry who have made themselves available. So. Don't feel like any question is too dumb or too small or uh, doesn't fit this evening. We want to make that. That's the reason why we're doing this. So you participants can have access to uh, these very important people in our industry. So uh, I will pass it back to Kim on a no look. Nope. Lay up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to kick this off and I'm going to you, Sean. All right. Uh, and then this is a three-part question. Okay. So let me create the scenario for you. 
Um, a hair coaching position has opened up. Excuse me, guys. <clears throat> okay, sorry. I should have muted myself. I didn't have that little button, you know, the little cough button. But anyway, uh, um, okay, so a head coaching position is opened up. And of course, several coaches are applying for it across the country. But in particular, two assistant coaches happen to be applying for this position. One happens to be Caucasian. The other one is African-American. Um, they both have very, very similar backgrounds. They were both collegiate standout athletes. Uh, they both had a stint playing professionally. And the African-American actually is a WNBA champion. Um, and the African-American happens to be um, a, a lot more successful in the with the team that she is currently coaching. Um, uh, let me see. What, what was the other two? Um, oh, uh, this would be both of their their first opportunity to be a head coach. But the kicker is they're, they're like best friends. So as they started kind of talking about this opportunity and they both realized that they could potential, that, that they were really in the running for this position, they started comparing notes and things. And so it finally came out that the Caucasian coach was offered 50,000 more uh, on her contract per year than her, her friend. So I, what I really wanted to ask you is, can you list some of the reasons why an athletic director would choose to offer coaches um, a higher salary over others? And then the second part of that, is that legal? And then the third part, um, you know, what can be done to offset, offset that type of behavior? It's a great scenario, uh, great questions. And I'll try to, uh, to walk through it just from, from my chair and, you know, when, first of all, when you're, when you're hiring a head coach, I'll just speak for, for myself. I, I want, you know, the best fit. Um, I, I will say I, I signed the, the uh, collegiate coaching diversity pledge, and I do think it is extremely important um, for, for athletic directors, those of us in, in positions to hire, that we do seek a, a diverse pool. So first and foremost, I also believe it's important we give women opportunities. So that's just, that's where I come from. But when you're talking about those two candidates, it's the unique experiences that they bring. So while you might have a successful coaching career, I don't think you can discount a successful playing career and the intangibles that come with that. Um, you know, so to me, it's, it's what can any candidate bring that's going to impact the lives of the young women that they're going to coach and mentor. So, you know, to me, I, I look at the totality of experience, right? It's easy to look at a resume and just see, okay, this is where they've been. They've been at a quote, power five school. They've done this. You have to look at the totality of, of what their journey has been. Uh, when you're talking about why one would be offered more than another, I, I do think there are likely scenarios where you're, you're, you're trying to possibly get a coach uh, to leave another institution and, and they may have more experience that might merit um, that type of salary uh, disparity. So I think that's, that's in terms of how you might negotiate or what you might offer someone. Uh, I, I do think if you have two candidates with similar backgrounds, uh, I, I, I don't think that's right. Uh, but that, that could be where that disparity might come in. And then I can't, now I can't remember the last part of it. That was so, it was. <laughs> okay, so it was, is that legal? And then what can, what can be done to offset that? Behavior? Yeah, I think the, the, yeah, Kim, I think the legal part comes more in when you're looking, when you're comparing maybe coaches uh, within a department. Uh, I think it's, you know, any, any athletic director or, you know, can offer a salary to a, a potential candidate. I think when we get into the legalities, and I, I think this is what is so important right now about the, with the gender equity review that's taking place within the NCAA now is the, is the, the pay gap and the pay disparity. I, I don't think it's fair, uh, potentially, if you have a, a candidate or two candidates, two different coaches with similar experiences, similar backgrounds, but with a significant pay gap. Um, I don't think that's right. I do think if there are other mitigating issues that, huh, this doesn't seem right. I'm, I have this level of experience what you're offering me or what you're paying me is not in line. So I, I do think there are cases where there could be complaints brought, but I think at the outset, 
you know, when you're bringing someone in, that's a negotiated uh, salary based on someone's experience and someone's background. I think it's once you get someone in where you can have real issues if you're promoting a, a, a male coach uh, over a, a female coach or, uh, you know, I think those are the things that, that certainly can raise eyebrows. And I just think, Kim, for all of us in positions of, of influence within departments, we have got to be better across the board. We've got to be more mindful. We've got to promote young coaches. We've got to give people opportunities. And I think we have to reward coaches for, for, for doing good work. And we have to recognize what those differences are because it, it's, it's on us. And I say this all the time, you know, there's a lot that we can do and everyone has been talking about what we can do to create change. Well, as athletic directors, we can hire people. We can provide opportunities. We can provide salary increases. We can do those things that will ultimately pave the way for opportunities that I think will better our industry and, and, and quite honestly, do right by people who do very, very good work. Thank you. Anyone else? Did anyone, Tamka, did anyone want to jump in on that? Well, if not, then I'm going to kick it to Brian. Yes, thank you, Kim. Uh, my question is for, I will still honor your name. Tamika, I said Tamika, I'm sorry. So, Tamika. It's Tamika. I'm sorry. I'm, it is. I'm I was sorry. right. That's what I, I, I it hit me, and I was like, "Wait a minute. What did I just say?" I was like, "It is Tamika." Oh, good. Okay, That's right. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. My my question is for I'll still say Coach uh, Huff. Um, my question is for you, Coach. You've been uh, a head coach at several different levels. You've been a head coach at um, more than one Division One university. Can you talk about uh, the truth, kind of behind the scenes, of maybe what? Uh, led you to be able to obtain those positions and have that success? And then what's some of the real that you overcame in order to get those positions and that you faced uh, that led to your success when you were in those? Okay, I appreciate you tagging me with coach because I, I don't think I lost it. I, I think I'm still uh, there in my mind. Uh, I think still, I'm still, still there. there. You, you're still, um, there. still there. Uh, well, first of all, I just, I appreciate y'all greatly um, by all means for, for, keeping me relevant. Let me say that. Let me say that. That's important these days, right? Um, but how did how did I get those positions? Um, and I get asked this quite a bit. Um, I do want to, because I'm seeing so many familiar faces and younger faces in the business. So first and foremost, hey, um, to you all. Um, I pride myself on, um, I think the word mentor is thrown out there a lot, but I think there's follow up and follow through with mentorship. Um, but I don't believe in necessarily X's and O's mentorship. I believe in Brian, and we've had this conversation about the reality of the business and what you should know, and it's way beyond what's on a sheet of paper. Um, how did I get those jobs? Uh, the work is the work. That, that's how that works. The work is the work. But I would be very short in telling you that being intentional about being relational is still not a thing. It's a thing. Um, and social media is not the only way that you're going to get to know people. Um, I, I was the coach that nobody knew. I mean, I got my first job uh, when Coach Mitchell was at Marquette and they played the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff and Danny Evans didn't know me from a can of paint, but I waited at the locker room after the game and with my Vista print card. And I said, hey, uh, I just want a shot, man. My, my mom's from the D. I know you're from the D and you got a spot. Uh, your kids are tough and, and I just want to be a part of it. Um, being from the North, you know, being connected to HBCUs was not a thing. The Circle City Classic was as close as we could get to it. And I just saw a different form of swag that I had not experienced in my life. And for me, that happened to be my foot in the door. Um, now, for everybody um, that's on here, some have had Black college experience, some haven't. That was my biggest blessing. That was my biggest blessing. And I say that to say my first time out the gate was doing everything from the root to the toot. And it was literally, I remember us taking, and I feel old, but these are stories that are now more relevant now than it was then. Um, we took the old football lockers and had the physical plant cut off the front because at the time, Sean, we talk equity, women's basketball was sharing a PE locker room and men's basketball had their own wing. So when that was making an attempt to be equitable, um, 
we found lockers on campus. So that's that budget line modification on my head coaches. So you're trying to find different ways to skin a cat. We got lockers, so we don't need lockers in the budget line. We were creating signs for lockers. We needed a wall put up so that the young ladies, you know, had separation. I'm saying all of this to say the work is the work. And that was at a GA spot. That was in year one. Then I had to learn how to do equipment. Then I've had to learn how to do budget. I had to learn how to have relationships on campus because we all know, especially at our black colleges, you got to know somebody to know somebody to push something through. That's how that works when it's all said and done. But that doesn't change at any university. I don't care if you're at a JUCO, a Division II, Division III, Division I, you have to be able to have relationships with people. Um, and I was open and honest with people. I got to say that I did not play college basketball. I know the game. I've been around the game my entire life. My passion is strength and conditioning. And I also found out going into UAPP, they didn't have an assistant strength and conditioning coach. So get your certifications, do what you got to do to get your foot in the door. And I was willing to wear multiple hats. Little did I know 15 odd years later, someone was watching me then and I, I would sweep the gym and I would be the person had to wash uniforms, but I didn't, there was no die in me. And to this day at 41, there's just no die in me. And so when I took interviews with people, it was someone that knew somebody. It was a recommendation, but I got to be honest with you. My first head coaching job was not simply because I knew somebody. I applied, y'all. That was it. I, I applied and said a prayer and Dianthea Forkey saw something in me and I went with it and it just went from there. But when I got into the CI, I saw women that looked like me and that had never happened to me. I was a all big 10 athlete. I competed in track and field. But it was a rarity that I saw women that looked like me in power positions across the board. And I had to align myself with those women because they spoke the way I wanted to speak. They did the things I wanted to do. And when I tell y'all, they gave it to me real raw and uncut. <laughs> they did on a regular basis. If Daryl was in some of them gyms, I should have got kicked out. So I say all of that to say, that is how I got my first job and I can't sit up here and tell you it's because I've had the gift of gab and I had a phenomenal resume. I had a big 10 resume that was non-basketball affiliated getting my first head coaching job, but I was prepared and I had met with people to learn how do I make this advantageous to an interview? How do, if I get to a board meeting, do I have enough portfolios to pass around the table, whether people look at them or not? How do I catch the attention of the people on the hiring how can I talk money and let them know I know budget management and we're not going to be the thorn in your side if you hire me? And then as life would have it, um, Mrs. Forkey ends up being the athletic director at Mississippi Valley State University. And I got the exact same phone call. You ready to rock? Yes, ma'am. You tell me where I need to be. Me and my son packed up and went to Itabina. And not knowing that Dianthea and Teresa Phillips, who's a legend in our game, knew each other. And the opportunity in the door opened. So I say all of this to say, you have to do right by people. I want, if there is nothing else that you hear from what I say in this conversation, and I haven't always done it right. And I will answer those fun questions about some hurdles that I had to climb, some that I was successful at, some that I could have used work at and needed help at. But the reality of the situation is people want to work with decent people. That's, that's the truth. It's easier to be in board meetings. It's easier to talk to people. It's easier uh, to get no in many different ways and eventually get a yes when you're working with someone um, that you actually like and are in it for the right reasons. But um, lastly, it was not paper chasing. And I, I need to say that as well. I was the lowest paid coach in every conference that I ever coached in. And I want to say that out loud because for me, I had other hustles always from the beginning. It wasn't about chasing the check. It was about chasing the opportunity. Um, and I pray when God sees fit, um, we'll get coach tag to my name again um, because of those reasons. And I pray that I left places better than um, when I got there. Thank you, coach. That was um, awesome. Uh, I'll pass it back to Kim. And Kim, oh my God, legend, just FYI. That's me being a fan. <laughs> hey. Oh my goodness. Okay. You have me sitting here like this, like, Wow, that was and an now, awesome answer. Wow. And now, and now everybody knows why Coach Huff's on the on the panel and why we still call her coach. 
Okay, again, I have to take a, a time out for a quick second. And just to say that all of you that are listening in, please, please, please ask questions. All right, Aaron, I got you. I saw you yesterday and I didn't pick on you, but I'm calling on you today. All right. <laughs> so anyway, ask questions. All right. So my next question, um, you know, we kind of kept it clean a little bit, but I don't want to get it messy because I, from what I hear from you coaches, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff that goes on too. Okay, so say an assistant coach finally gets the job um, and and this is going to go to you, Tamika, and they finally get a job and they're doing great. I mean, the players love them. I mean, the administrators love them. Uh, You know, they're they're just doing everything right. And all of a sudden, the head coach is not feeling that. The head coach starts to kind of sabotage or just kind of kind of starts to shut things down for that person. How how should an assistant coach handle that, especially when it's their first go round? See, I'm going to um, talk to Daryl about these questions after. <laughs> uh, these, this, these are on the hard balls today, huh? Uh, I, I was over here. Well, I, I'm, I, I, I'm, 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 I, I, didn't, I, didn't know these, I didn't know these questions was coming. Listen, I was yeah. I was sitting over here saying I was glad I wasn't Sean, but now, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, Jessica said it. I mean, mentorship is, is very important. And I, I do believe that, you know, head coaches do have a responsibility to uh, assistant coaches, their staff, just like they do their student athletes. And so, I pride myself and I can only speak, you know, from my experience of getting to know my complete staff. Um, And and I do that for several reasons. I mean, they're my team, my family. We're going to spend a lot of time together. So it's not just my, um, you know, fabulous head coach, Coach Blue, who's on the call right now. Um, But it's also um, Janie, it's Kim, it's Noel, it's, it's our Dobo that I am engaging. I go check on you know, see what their um, growth plan is um, and get to know them. And so a part of my responsibility also in, in this is probably um, mentoring head coaches as well. So when there are things that we see that we need to be able to, you know, just ask questions I've learned in my career, 23 years of this, to just ask questions, you know, uh, why you feel that way about, you know, your assistant coach, you know, what, what's going on? Talk to me, tell me something. And coach blue hadn't been with me, but about three months now. And I sit in our office, I go in there every day and I say, what's going on? How's everything going? And, you know, just gives her an opportunity to open up, share anything that she may, you know, need to share me, share some of my experiences, but I also do that with her assistant coaches too. So as an assistant coach, if you find yourself in a situation where you're not being supported, um, just quite frankly, run. <laughs> that's, a, that's, that's probably your best bet. Um, and I think that's at any level. You've got to be able to have, you, you've got to know who you're working with and leadership is so, so important. I've been at the highest levels of this. Um, I value who I work for and with, um, call them teammates now because of you know the, the, the job that I present and, and what I can bring to the table uh, more than anything, more than any salary or anything. So if you feel feeling that way, um, you know, if you don't want to run, because I do know people have to feel that, feed the families, uh, I think you should, you know, be mature about it. We're all professionals, you know, have the conversation. They're tough conversations. Sometimes, you know, it's very uncomfortable, but I've been a person always to be forthright. Um, there's a way to, you know, have that, that conversation, uh, be thoughtful about your approach. I would, you know, definitely get some advice, you know, like we're giving you right now, but, um, you know, have the conversation. Uh, the other thing that I would I would say is, um, you know, for for um, assistant coaches, you've you've got to build networking relationships. And those are so important. And I mean, we can say it until we you know go crazy, but it, it is important because um, the, one of the most important things I've learned probably in the last 10 years, probably since I left um, Clark Atlanta. Um, and that is is not as much of important who, you know, but who knows you. Who's going to call you? Who's going to, you know, give you an opportunity? Who's going to think about you when they've got opportunities? Um, and if you're putting your head down and, and just trying to get it done, do what the, your head coach is saying and, and not building relationships outside, um, it's going to be tough to, to pivot. 
It's going to be tough to, you know, be a pro sometimes because you're going to feel, you know, isolated and siloed and, and not have a, a circle of, of support that you might be able to go to. Um, but, you know, for the for the main, you know, point of this, I think that, you know, communication is key. You got to you, you you're coaches and leaders for a reason. You got to use that gift and that skill set and communicate. Talk to people, even if it's going to be a hard conversation. Um, document, document. I mean, this gets into the, the nitty gritty of, you know, your future forward, because one thing I strongly believe in that is controlling my narrative. You know that, you know, I'm not going to let anybody mischaracterize me and you don't let people mischaracterize you by having conversations with people, uh, making sure that, you know, what are people saying about you? And so that may be some things that are going on as an assistant coach that you could, you know, tighten up on, do better, you know, be a better teammate, be a better assistant and support. Um, that, you know, if you have those tough conversations can be exposed um, and you could be doing it right. And it could just be, you know, like Kim said, you know, um, I guess a jealous spirit that somebody's feeling like you got a different influence on their team. Um, that's a that's a tough one because um, most good coaching, you know, um, staffs want that type of influence across the board. But if you feel like you're, you know, you're not getting supported or you're being sabotaged, um, I, I, I said it from the heart, and that is run. Leadership is important. Um, find you a, a, a safe place to, to be able to work and show up fully. Um, you got to be doing, you know, a person of integrity and, and someone that your, your head coach can trust and your teammates can trust. Um, I, I, I think as assistant coaches, and I did this, um, uh, my head coach, Coach Blue, gave me the opportunity to speak to her staff at, the, um, at her coaches retreat to start off. And this is the first time head coach. Um, so I took it very serious being able to speak to her staff. Um, and one of the things we did was scenarios just like this, you know, to prepare them. Like this is your first head coach opportunity. These things are going to happen. What, how are we going to, we, we don't want to be dealing. You don't want to be, you know, trying to figure it out while we're in the, in the, you know, adversity. Um, but those are some of the recommendations that I would, I would share. Thank you. Anyone else want any of that? Don't be scared. No, it's good. I, I, Lon <laughs> is right. I think the, the biggest thing too, I would say is, you know, as an assistant coach, you should have a, a relationship with your AD. That, and, and I think as Tamika said it, you know, we, we have to get to know the entire staff, but we spend probably more time with head coaches, but as assistants, get to know your AD, build a relationship because when, when things are, uh, critical, you have to be able to go in and communicate. And if there's something with an issue with your head coach and you have a relationship that's trusting and built on respect with your AD, then you can have that conversation. And so I think that's really, really critical. And, and that's correct, Sean. I think it's more or less on the head coach having security within himself. You know, most head coaches, if they find you're adequate in doing the job, sometimes that does happen. But most importantly, get with a head coach that's very secure about himself and his position and try to help you develop and don't mind you having those conversations with administrations um, across campus. I definitely want to echo that in having security as a head coach in regards to just being confident in your craft. I think if you did your due diligence in hiring your staff and doing the background check in, regard, in regards to personality types, um, strengths and weaknesses, and especially what assistants, because I, I never just coached assistants assuming they would stay my assistant for the rest of their life. Um, it was a time in which it's time for you to fly. Um, and to me, that means I did my job and I think I did it well um, when those assistant coaches land head coaching positions, whether it's at the collegiate level or not. So I just, I say that to say, but um, there is etiquette and decorum. I do wanna say that when going to an administration Administrator or going to an administrator's office, X, Y, and Z. Um, but that all goes along with having a great relationship with your head coach. Um, because I'm, I'm looking at some of the faces on here and we've, we've had these conversations already and we've had the conversations about every job's not a great job. Um, you want to be working for someone you truly believe in and that you're extremely seamless with your vision. And I think when that happens, it's a lot easier to get mentorships from your higher ups and be comfortable with conversations um, when you know what you're getting yourself into and vice versa from head coaches to assistants. I would like to add, you know, while head coaches do hire assistant coaches, 
assistant coaches really need to make sure that it's a good fit for them. Yes, you want to be an assistant coach and one day be a head coach, but you got to make sure it's a good fit because if the if the if you haven't done your due diligence to interview that head coach and see what their style is and their leadership skills are, their leadership skills and their strategies may rub your grain in such a way that it makes it difficult for you to be Hello. What happened? Hmm. Don't know. I'm not sure if you guys, I got unmuted for some reason. No, we hear you. Okay. So I, I'm not sure how much you didn't hear, but I'm saying, what I'm saying is you should interview the head coach position, head coach person, because they may, you need to make sure they're a good fit for your development. It's one thing to take the job is another thing to make sure it's a good fit because the head coach is also looking for a good fit. So like you're being interviewed, you should also interview and do your homework on the head coach's style to make sure it fits your needs and your development growth. All right. Well, I'm going to pass that one and thank you all for your wonderful answers. I'm gonna pass it back to Brian because we are about ready to get it started. Uh, and open things up for your questions. Yeah, thanks, Kim. And uh, Coach Huff, I know you said coach may be next to your name coming soon, but I think it also may be administrator may be coming up on your uh, possible list of names too. But uh, my question is for everyone this next round. It's kind of a lightning round. We'll go try to go a minute, minute and a half. Uh, just picking one characteristic for good and one maybe for uh, not so good. What is a characteristic or an attribute that you believe uh, contributes to someone becoming a head coach? And then also, what do you think is something that can get in the way uh, of them becoming a head coach? Anyone can go in any order. And, and, I, and I'll go back and say not only just a head coach, but a head coaching candidate, because I think that's one thing that most people that are in the room, if you haven't been a head coach and you're aspiring to be one, you want to know how to get on the list to be a candidate and then to actually become a head coach. You know? um, I'll go if no one minds. Um, I think a, a good attribute is uh, patience. I can't say I had it, but I can say that now. Um, I, I'd say patience and I'd say patience because I think you have this amazing game plan, right? I'm going to be a head coach at 30. I am going to be a division one head coach at this age. I am going to run this defense. I'm going to run this offense. Wait, I don't have a six, five center. Wait, I don't have a shooter. Oh, wait, kids are injured. Oh, they're academically ineligible. So when I say patience, like you have to have some patience and grace. I think that's a great quality, uh, for, Anybody leading a company, leading a team, leading an athletic department, leading a university, um, because things don't go according to plan. I have the three to five rule. My staff always knew three to five things typically are going to go wrong before 12 noon. So just let it ride. That's a normal day. And then things get normal. It, that, it just works that way. Um, I think one of the things that is a poor attribute I think a lot of coaches have, and unfortunately we learn it the hard way, is pride. Our pride gets in the way sometimes of our purpose. Um, and I think we have to find the balance between making it solely about you and your vision and what it takes for the greater good. And sometimes that has to take a back seat. Um, and so I would say those are two attributes, um, but I think a great quality. Um, and I hate to say it because if I could look at my 21 year old self and talk to my 41 year old self, I would have been like, duh, just listen. It would have worked itself out. Um, but I need I needed to have patience. Um, but I did have to learn when you are working with less to get more, that less of your pride became a part of the equation and more humility ended up um, getting in the way and um, becoming in the forefront of everything that you do. So those are the two things I would say. Those are good. I'll jump in. Um, those are really good. I, I think the, the thing that to me matters most is authenticity. Be, be real, be you. Don't try to win a job because of something you think that AD or administrator wants to hear. If you don't get a job because you're not a fit or, or that AD doesn't vibe with you, then that's okay. Wasn't meant to be. 
but the best fits are when you're your authentic self, you're real, you're you, and that's a fit, then that's the best thing. Uh, that's the best fit. And then I think something that, that, that really can, can go wrong quickly is a couple things, but, but a lack of accountability. You know, there, there's, and, and I get it, we're all in this to, we're, we're trying, we're, we're working hard. No one gets into this to fail. But at the end of the day, I, as an AD, everything in the department, it, it, it rests on my shoulders and I'm accountable. And I think as a, as a head coach, you're accountable to everything within your program. And it's not about, you know, what the, what the facilities person didn't do right or, or the equipment person. It's, it's, it's on you to help bring all those things together and to build those relationships with those different departments so that you can have this harmonic uh, opportunity that ultimately leads to success. And, you know, to me, everything is it's rooted in, in uh, love and respect. And when you have that, everything is great. And when you don't, things go wrong really fast. Yes, um, the, the first thing I, I would think is, um, you know, you've got to be, uh, you know, proven, result driven, um, able to deliver. So, you know, your resume, um, I think Jessica said the work is the work. So, I mean, uh, you can have the character and all the other checks and balances, but um, I'm always looking for a proven winner, um, you know, so it's important as assistants, where you are, where you go, you know, where you've been. Um, I think at some point when you're looking to be a head coach, quite frankly, you need to have, you know, made some observations of that as a, um, a result driven person, proven winner, um, someone that can deliver, deliver, because at the end of the day, um, Coaches are hired for W's and, and less L's. So um, the second the second part of that question about you know um, uh, what was the second part of the, of the question, uh, Brian? Uh, Just one factor that uh, for positive and one factor that may get in the way. Uh, yeah. Of that. Yeah. So um, I think the thing that would probably get in the way is when coaches don't have enough self-reflection. Um, I'm, I'm big on, um, just, you know, my own self-reflection. Um, I, I'm so proud to have, um, had an opportunity to hire coach Octavia blue because she, you know, every day is like doing her own assessment of her, her, you know, what could she have done, you know, differently? What are her actions? What are her intentions and motives and you know and and she's asking questions just you know kind of got that all that self-check um in her own spirit and her own actions every day and I think uh, a lot of times as coaches as administrators I've been a coach before as well um I feel like I coach administrators now so I love that part of my job um we don't we don't slow down enough to to really reflect on you know what have we done? What are we, we just going through the motion. You just, you know, getting the game scouts, you're getting the practice plans, you're, you know, um, going from one thing to another. Um, but in that self-reflection time, I think it helps you to um, continue to develop, continue to be thoughtful, um, helps you be able to manage um, all of the operation because as a head coach, I mean, assistant coaches, m mind you, you have a lot of responsibility, but a head coach, if you've never been in that seat, you have no idea. And like, like Sean said, it, it is all on you at the end of the day. And so I think as assistant coaches, if you could take some time now, um, every day, you know, after you finish at midnight watching your film, um, that's probably what deterred me from the coaching world is the all day film sessions. It, it's never ends for, for coaches, but um, take the time to, you know, just do a self-assessment, self-reflect about what went wrong, what did you did, you know, more today, what you want to do better, improve on, who you need to get around you to help you with these, you know, areas that you have, you know, want us, you know, get better in. I think that'll that'll prepare you and get and take you a long way in this profession. Yeah, awesome answers. Thanks so much, all of you. I'll pass it back to Kim. I think we're getting close to opening up to the audience. Oh, I thought we were going to open it up now. Well, let's do it. You're the boss. Let's yeah, go. I thought we're, we're only doing two. We, we want to get out of the way because we want to give them space and time to ask the questions that they want to ask. And then plus, 
I, I, I don't want to be too much harder on the on the uh, panel. You know, I just want to kind of <laughs> you know take it easy on them, you know, because <laughs> my third uh, one was going to be I a home it. run. But I'm, I'm going to pop I my brakes. It. I love well, it. I love it. Well, if you, if you well, don't mind, she, participants. Go ahead. Sorry, Daryl. Well, since we we got to open it up, I, I I want to open it up with a question that I think is very important for the two um, administrators in regards to the process when it comes to um, selecting a head coach. I think a lot of coaches here um, want to be head coaches, but they need to understand the process, the preparation, what it takes to get to that point where you're going to be considered for the job. And if you are considered, um, what are some of the things they're going to have to deal with doing that process in terms of interviewing, what you guys look for, um, what's important, um, and all that kind of stuff. And I think that's important that they hear that as well um, at this point. So I'll open that question up for you. Start with you, Sean, and then you, Tamika, um, to elaborate on the process um, that's involved with this. Yeah, that's a great question. And, and I think Tamika said it about, you know, a proven record of success. So for me, I love giving uh, first-time coaches an opportunity, first-time head coaches, because I believe they're hungry. I believe those who have really worked their way up and have taken on different positions and have grown and evolved, uh, but have built strong networks through their recruiting and they position themselves. So it's, you know, the, the, the next step, and this, this isn't the only type of person, but I, I think for um, for me, it's all about who have they worked with, who have they worked under, who have they learned from, what responsibility have they been given? Uh, did they run the offense? Did they manage the budget? Did they work with compliance and academics so that, you know, as head coach, you're dealing with all of it. So you have to know how to delegate it, but you know how, how to have, you need to know how to manage it. And, you know, when you move that one seat over, it's a totally different world. So who's ready for it? Uh, who knows what it takes? And, you know, I'm looking for someone who's going to bring new ideas. And I mentioned it before. I want someone who's, I'm not hiring someone. I just, you know, we had a, a successful uh, coach who just left. I was not looking for a, a, a copycat version. I wanted someone who's going to come in and take our program in a new direction, take us to new heights, but doing it per way. And, you know, I want to get excited when I'm sitting talking with someone because there are a lot of great coaches who know the X's and O's. Uh, and yes, you have to understand that and you have to know how to win and recruit. But I want to know the vision. I want to know the culture of your program. I want to know how you're going to develop young women and mentor them and prepare them for life. I want like that should not be something I have to ask about. So I like it when we're in conversation and that just comes out naturally because it's it's a, so much about what happens off the court. Uh, so to me, it is, you know, and again, build the resume, make good choices. And this is about assistance. Make good choices on where you go. Go to programs where you're going to have a chance to be successful and get some responsibility. Because when you're sitting in that interview chair, uh, I want to hear that. I, I want to hear about that. And, you know, to me, it's, it's somebody who's hungry, who's ready, but who is taking this next step as a head coach because they've been successful. And again, as Jessica said, it's, it's, it's their time to fly. And that's, that's what I'm looking for. And to me, it's a, uh, it's a great process. And I think too, pick up the phone and just call the AD directly. You know, we do get bombarded with emails and calls, but don't be afraid to do that because sometimes if you, uh, you know, don't have an agent representing you, it, it just the old fashioned way of picking up the phone, introducing yourself still works in this world. Thank you, Sean. Good deal, Sean. That's that's excellent. Um, the only only thing that maybe I'll add is is kind of some of the process, just in case some of you all have not had a chance to interview for a head coach position. I wish I could toss this one over to Coach Blue. Um, she did an awesome job on the uh, Rising Coaches panel um, this summer. Thanks, Adam and and Daryl, for having us um, here in the city to do that. Um, but, you know, the, the process uh, pretty much, you know, I think when Brian, you got on, you said we met at a think tank 
um, you know, WBCA, um, rising coaches, these types of things are critically important. I mean, to um, building relationships. And, and I'll tell you, I've hired uh, first time head coaches at least three times in the last 10 years. Um, and I've gotten most of my short list from these types of settings and, and networks. And so if you don't think that this kind of stuff matters, it, it really does matter. Um, the, so, you know, as, as administrators, when we're hiring, we're, we absolutely have a short list. Um, we're also calling the pros like, you know, Adam and Daryl and, and, and others. Um, I've gotten um, so savvy now, I guess, that, that I got agents call me when things open up. And so that makes it a lot easier for me. So I get a list fast. But um, make sure you're connected to the right people. That's why that network is so important. Let people know what you're interested in and what you're trying to do and what the fit is for you. Um, if you're not going to move out of Atlanta, you know, which was my reputation until I left Atlanta, you know, you, you better tell people that you, you will move or else they'll mischaracterize you, have a narrative for you. And that could be a reason why you're not getting opportunities. Um, but, you know, prepare yourself for sure, you know, with, with your um, portfolio of what you would do and, and be prepared to be able to, to do that. Um, I mean, even as an administrator, um, I go in and, and for jobs that I may have an opportunity for, I share with them a portfolio of what I plan to do. And given, given the job, I, I do a self-reflection almost every six months, 12 months to just um, check on what I said I was going to bring and produce for that institution. And, uh, and so as assistant coaches, you can start doing that now. What are your goals and objectives for, you know, for your season for the year? Um, and, and how do you prepare yourself to be able to present that to an athletic director and sometimes even a, a, a president? Um, you know, that, that piece of, um, you know, the part of the phone interview, I think all of that is, is you know, coaches are natural at that. But once you get on campus, uh, when you have to get in person with, with, with folks, I think it's critically important that um, you're in a position where you can speak to um, the president and chancellor, you can speak to the, the VP of student affairs, you can speak to legal counsel. Um, if you're not building those relationships right now on campus, you, you're behind the game. You, you get, put yourself in a position where you are involved. I mean, I know as assistants, you're, you've got your student athletes running all over, all over campus, doing all types of things for the student body have a relationship with the VP of student affairs, the Dean of students. Um, if the more that you can have those conversations, the more comfortable you will be when you show up on a campus for an interview and you will likely have to be in front of those um, types of um, colleagues and, and campus leaders. So um, the, the other piece of it, I think um, I'll leave you with, and I see the hands um, and, and I know you have questions is, um, you know, be, be prepared to be a professional in front of the student athletes when you get a chance to meet them on your campus visit. I mean, I think sometimes coaches go in, um, like Sean said, uh, you know, you've got to be your authentic self. But sometimes coaches go in way too casual. It becomes all about them. You know, they're, they're lean back, legs crossed. You know, what, are, what are, the, are the questions you have for us to the student athletes? You know, Treat them like they're professionals, too, because um, at the levels that I've been at, the institutions I've been, I mean, these student athletes are bright. Um, they can read right through, you know, people that just want a job, just want an opportunity. Um, you've got to make sure that you make them feel like um, they're the most important and the most, um, you know, unique part of the entire visit. And I'm just glad to say that that's what Coach Blue presented to us at Kennesaw. Um, and, and, you know, as assistant coaches, you got it in you. Um, you just got to definitely prepare. Um, there are opportunities to do mock interviews. Don't take those for granted. Do as many of them as you can. You just, you just never know when you're going to get a question that may stunt you that you hadn't gotten before, that you can go back and prep on it this time and not blow a job opportunity. So that's all I'll share right now. Thank you, uh, Tamika, for that enlightening. And you too, Sean, as well. That was, that was very important. We ask that, we're gonna start taking questions now. We ask that you direct your questions to someone specifically on the panel. We'll start with Coach Manuel. Um, I ask you that you unmute yourself and then we'll go with Coach Hopkins after Coach Manuel. 
Hello, um, my name is Taija Emanuel. I'm coaching, at, I'm an assistant at Rogers State University. Um, and I'll mute yourself, coach. Can you hear me now? Now we can. Um, my name is Taija Emanuel, assistant at Rogers State University. Um, I don't really have a specific person on the panel this is to, but I know the last two nights, uh, mentorship and networking has been talked about. Um, and my question is, what is the best way to go about finding a mentor that kind of relates and correlates to your values? Because I know there's been ways to find a mentor, but sometimes they don't always fit the best. Uh, Coach Kerr, you want to take that one? Sure. I'd say first and foremost, you got to get out of your own way. Um, I think that's really, really important. Um, you know, when people say the you, you, you have to know what you want and you have to absolutely go for it. And I, I agree with you. I think every mentor, just because they may have won championships, I'm going to be honest with you, um, just because they may have done things on a very big scale doesn't mean that there's a relatability factor. I think that's extremely important. Um, I think you have to do your research and finding someone that you'd be interested in and in mimicking to a degree. Um, and then like Ms. Borky, you always used to say, put your stank on it, you know, make it your own. Um, and that was really, really important. Um, and then daring to be different. I, I think that's important. Guys, I, and, and to date and people laugh at me, but I mean, I have a million types of handwritten note cards. These ones say Marshall, this one says first lady, that says the foundation. Like, I'm just gonna write handwritten notes. And I, and I put small things, affirmations in there that make sense for me. Um, I, I like nice stuff. I don't apologize for that. If I got an extra jean jacket, I'm still waiting for Tamika to wear one of mine and post it, but that's okay. Um, see that shameless plug? Put it out there. No problem putting that out there. I'm just saying you have to find somebody and align yourself and, ha and be forthcoming and saying, listen, I want to be good at this. I can't take a whole lot of your time. And I think the mistake that's also made in mentorship is you don't specifically know what to ask for. For example, you just had two administrators that told you, we are looking to hire head coaches that have compliance experience. We are looking to hire head coaches that have academic experience. I don't know about you, but when I was a young coach, compliance was overwhelming. What's so wrong with walking over to your director of compliance and not just taking the exam, but learning the essence of rules so I don't have to come in and get an interpretation for a compliance officer that I know is overwhelmed on a regular basis. That's what I'm talking when I'm saying taking the first step. You just have to align your people that you align yourself with people that have like visions. And I'm going to also say this, stop taking no for an answer. I, I didn't take no for an answer. If they only had two minutes, I better come with the best two minutes and questions and that they had time for because those two minutes made me better than sometimes people around me who were not making me better. Does that make sense? You have other plateaued through social media, emails, snail mail. There are so many avenues to find yourself a mentor. Um, and I would say just like all the administrators have told, have said, and I'm going to say, you got to put yourself out there, period. Like I, I was the one at the final four and I was at schools. Let me say this because I get it, sis. I was at schools who could not pay for me to go to the final four, but I paid my way to make sure I could get there, get in a room with somebody, but figure it out. Cause I wanted to be where people were that were doing things. I, I had to figure out how does that happen? How do I make that happen? So um, get out of your own way and, and go for it. And, uh, and eventually a door will open. Thank you, coach. Coach let Hopkins, me, you, you DJ, have, go ahead, Tamika. Let me just, let me just um, make sure not that Jessica, you need any clarification, but I love that invest in yourself piece. Um, but um, also, you know, it, it, you got to know what you what you need. Jessica said that. But that's a, that's a part of that self-reflection. Like you you when I was coming up and, and coaching, I was coaching at 22, 23. Um, I would look at the bios of people. I would look at the bios of people in our league and find out what they were doing how they got to where they are, places that I wanted to be. And those were conversation starters for me. And I would communicate with them. I keep those same um, approaches even today as a twice sitting athletic director, twice, you know, number two in the department, FPS, FCS level, doesn't matter. 
you've, you've got to be intentional and you've got to be able to be relational. Um, I text people just thinking about you. I, you know, I will wear the jacket, Jessica, just send it. It's got to have the right colors on it though. Um, so you, you got to, and that's, that goes back to Sean saying this authenticity, like you, you, what, how do you just show up comfortable, your best person every day? How do you deal with the, your best friends every day, the people that you're most comfortable with, treat the people that you think that you want in your life as mentors in that same way. That's what I've done all of my career. And it has worked perfectly. I mean, it, it has worked perfectly. And I, I try to build deep relationships, but sometimes they stay very surface and I don't push those. It's okay. But the ones that deepen, keep going with it. And you'll always have what you need. But I think if you find out what you need, what where the weaknesses are of you, she talked about compliance. Like compliance officers can be mentors. Compliance directors can be mentors. Who, I mean, are you just looking for head coaches or athletic directors to be mentors? I've looked for people that had to step up. So I've got relationships with presidents and VPs like no other. But when I was an assistant coach, I was looking at head coaches and I was building those relationships. So I just wanted to make sure that I, I added that value um, to you, Ms. Manuel. Thank you, Beth. Coach Hopkins. Hi, I'm Daniel Hopkins. I'm actually a student right now at Cornerstone University. I play there and then I'm a student assistant for our men's basketball team. And my question was just like, as I want to go into coaching after I graduate, what were things that um, Coach Huff or um, Tamika or Sean that you guys like look for in the hiring process or like things to do beforehand as like, I'm just a young college student that would help like get me ready and prepared like post-grad. I can start that one. Um, are, are you doing anything now outside of, of your student athlete role? Are you? So um, I like play basketball. And then as a student assistant for the men's team, I run a lot of our social media. I do like our gear orders, meal orders, like a lot of organizational stuff for our head coach. Yeah, that's good. That's operations. So, yeah. So um, I, I think you, you definitely need to make sure your resume, you know, represents you well from the things that you've done. I mean, don't over embellish it as a, you know, just coming out of, out of um, undergrad, but um, you know, take the opportunity that presents itself that you think you can be successful. You'll get some, but if you do have still have time, I don't know if you're a senior or, or what, but if you do have time, I would advise you to get involved with some of the um, resources that the NCAA has the leadership resources and, and build your um, portfolio in a leadership way um, outside of just your sport that will, you know, showcase a lot of your skills and, and giftings that, that you already have. Um, um, there are opportunities, there are scholarships, there's opportunities to, to get um, um, internships and things of that nature. Um, I think there's a, a, a coaching um, um, series that they have. Um, I did Women and Coaches, the Women's Coaches Academy when I was about 20, 23 or so. Um, back in the day. So I know there are a lot of tracks that you can get involved in. Um, your school will probably invest in some of those tracks as well. So, you know, let people know what you're trying to do. Um, I think you've got a good start already um, going outside of the women's side and, and getting over to the men's side. So kudos to you on that. Um, and if I could be of any support to you, feel free to reach out, reach out to me. It's, it's about connections too. When people know you're looking for opportunities, we can, you know, pitch you and say, you know, we know a young lady, Danielle, that's, that's looking for these opportunities. So. Thank you. Yes. We have another question from coach Watkins. Hello. First, I want to say thank you guys for sharing your time with us. Um, my name is Jamira Watkins and I recently just graduated college. Um, I'm a volunteer coach at Patterson Eastside and I wanted to know what can I do to really make my impact on this industry? Um, not just impact girls, but I really want to impact them through the game of basketball and through life as well. 
Well, first of all, I just I think that's awesome. And, you know, I think that, that we're all in this to impact uh, society, impact young people. And so, you know, I think what you've heard a lot of is really, really important. And that's building those connections, uh, creating those networks. There are a lot of organizations that you can tap into that it, it's just about connecting with more and more people. And I, I do think that's the key to it because the, the, the larger your network, again, the more impact you can have and, and find your path. I think it's figuring out what it is you want to do. Is it through coaching? Is it through administration? Is it what is it that you really want to do and what, what you're most passionate about? I think for a lot of people, you know, find that that one thing that you're most passionate about and, and direct your energy toward that and connect with people. The one thing I say, and, and I, I know, uh, you know Tamika said it, we're all of us who are in positions, we've all been at one time where you are now, where we're aspiring, we're, we're just, we're hoping someone will take a call. And so anytime anybody emails me or calls me and says, could you have, give me five to 10 minutes? I'd love to introduce myself. And I, I, every single time I say yes. So, you know, there are a lot of people, don't be afraid to make a call to someone who either at a program that you, you know, you admire and you would want to be a part of because 99% of the time, uh, someone's going to take your call and, and at least give you a few minutes to, to, to help. And, you know, if they don't, well, they've lost their way because we've all been there before. And you know, I just would say, too, is don't lose faith in, in what your ultimate destination is, because there are a lot of doors that close. Uh, but it is it's those opportunities. And, and again, Jessica mentioned it very early on. Take those opportunities when they come and, and realize that each contact you have is an opportunity to make a positive change. I would just add, um, you know, make yourself multidimensional and multifaceted. Um, although coaching is our avenue and, and that's quote unquote what we do, um, being able to come to the table with many different angles is extremely important. Um, you know, when I got into being a GA, um, I went and got my strength and conditioning um, certification. It was, an assess it was a need that the university needed. They needed a female on top of that to work with the non-tier one sports. Um, I know I needed a little extra cash. That was a good thing. And so it helped. It, it really, really helped. Um, but, you know, for example, um, I was um, teaching a continued education English class. Uh, my last portion of grad school. So then I got to see, okay, maybe I can work in HPER and that be another angle, you know, in which I can take, um, which ended up leading to me having a connection with the Boys and Girls Club there in the area. So I say that to say, you said you really wanted to make an impact on the industry. Um, changing lives, I think, is why absolutely every person is on this call. Um, I, I don't think that's a, necessarily just a male thing, a female thing. I think you got into it to make a difference. And whatever lane, you know, God tended to steer us all down is how we're making our way. So whatever your niche is um, right now, if you've been able to hone in on that and find out what you're really great at, um, don't be afraid to come in, you know, with a loaded, with loaded options, because having multiple options, uh, it helps and sort of kind of forces people to make decisions when it comes to, to hiring you, because you, you fill voids. And sometimes that's a really attractive thing when people are looking at, especially entry-level positions, is it, how can this person really help us in multiple ways? Thank you both for that. We have time for uh, maybe one or two more questions before we turn it over back over to Kim Hampton, uh, Vice President for Women Basketball. Do we have? This is a great opportunity to ask these industry leaders and those who've been in the industry these questions that you may have been pondering or thinking about, um, take advantage of this opportunity. Because um, in a lot of cases, people got to pay for this kind of thing, believe it or not. Um, and I'm telling you that right now. So to have this distinguished panel here, um, sharing their expertise and knowledge with you is priceless. I mean, it's, it's priceless. So don't miss up on this opportunity, but also they talked about making a connection and networking. What better way to get yourself seen by asking the question? 
to let these industry leaders know who you are um, as well. So don't miss this opportunity um, to do that. And maybe Kim has have a question that she may want to ask. I'm gonna be ready for that. We don't, we don't have enough time left to go. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and we could we could we could probably close it out with Kim and her final questions, and then she can close it out as well. I know she has a question that's probably gonna be for the whole panel that's gonna be very beneficial for our attendees. Absolutely. No, actually, you know, guys, I mean, you know what it is, is the questions that I have after giving, after the panelists have given such great answers, like these are, these are fluff questions and I don't want to ask, Brian, do you have a good one, a really good one? I want a really good, like, the, come on, there's not a coach out there that has a really good answer, like something that has been eating at you, something that you need to know, something that could potentially advance your career. I mean, because I, we, we've heard yeah. Well, let's talk yeah, about. I can, pro- I, can, I, can ju- I can jump in. I can jump in on one since you offered it. Now, what would you say? Look back to me. Right. Okay. And, and what Go ahead, you Brian. Say there? I yes. was going to talk about program management. I think that gets lost in translation. Um, a lot of times when coaches get jobs, they forget about program management, um, how to manage a program. And I think that's something it all depends where you come from. So I think that would be. Um, and I think um, Sean and um, as well as Jessica, as well as Tamika might have hit on that. But I think that gets lost because sometimes they get jobs and think that all they're going to do is coach. But you got to realize you got to manage your program. You got to manage people. Um, you got to manage budgets, as they mentioned. You got to manage this. You got to manage that. So I think that gets lost in translation. Believe me, attendees, you know, getting a head coaching job is just not coaching on the floor. There's a lot. That goes with it. We ain't even talking about alumni. We ain't talking about fundraising. There's a lot. We talked about compliance. You're talking about dealing with internal and external constituents. Um, there's a lot that goes in that. And that can be at any level, whether you're at the collegiate level, high school level, or even dealing with um, youth basketball. You know, these are things that you should be learning early on. And particularly, as we mentioned, getting with a mentor who will show you this, um, give you those responsibilities where you can take on that as well. That's what this thing is all about. And these are the questions I was hoping you would have um, with this panel here. And um, we got time. If someone really wanted to ask a question, please ask the question. Um, again, people pay for this kind of um, um, seminar um, to have these distinguished people here. And don't be scared to ask the question. We got time for one more before we close it out. And I can bring on the brain trust behind this um, whole operation. DJ, I just want to, um, you know, share a bit on on you, you know, drawing, going down the checklist of all the things that <laughs> if you're trying to be in the head coach position that you, you better know um, enough about, um, you know, again, uh, our head women's basketball coach, Coach Blue is on and, and one of our assistants, Coach Noel is on. Um, they'll tell you in an interview, once you get the call to interview for a position is less about your X's and O's. (laughs) I mean, I don't even know how much me and coach blue talked about X's and O's because I'd watched her coaching at Miami and I knew enough about her background and experience as it relates to that, as it was about everything else, how she was going to manage her program. And that's when we say, you know, you, it's got to be better than the the portfolio presentation you got to be able to communicate exactly all the nuts and bolts of a program from A to Z. And if you are not involved in the program in that way right now, that's the conversation you probably need to be having with your head coach as soon as you get back to, to, to campus, um, you know, where your weaknesses are and how can you, you know, get involved in some of that. Um, coach Blue and I talked about, you know, fundraising and development. Um, you know, she's a hall of famer at Miami. So she was involved in a lot of, you know, things that dealt with fundraising and development. So she was ready. She, our development officer asked her that question coming out the gate. And so, um, and, and it all, but how much money you raised and she was able to, to share, you know, detailed that experience, uh, about that. So it's really, really important. If you don't have a checklist of, of, you know, program management, if you don't have a clue 
what your head coach is doing on a day-to-day basis. Uh, that's a great start for you after this call to, to find out some of those things. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, um, Brian, did you want to ask your question? I did, but my mom raised me right, so I have to let Coach Watkins go again first because ladies go first. Okay. I have one more question. Oh, I didn't see her. Yes. Sorry, Coach Watkins. <laughs> Um, this isn't directed to anybody. Um, in the beginning of your coaching career, what hurdles do you all, what hurdles do you believe that you faced that helped make you the coach you are today? So that was, that was actually my question too. So I'm glad you asked that coach Bachman so eloquently. So, uh, we'll, we'll close with that last question. I have so many things going through my mind. I don't really know where to start, to be honest. (laughs) I think I've been from the root to the two. Um, I'm picking my words carefully. If you had had to pick one significant one um, that you think would be valuable, that would, that would be awesome. If each, if everyone can share one, I'm I'm going to, I think I'm going to combine. I think I'm going to combine what we just addressed and like this one. And I want to, to um, hone in on people management being a key component and in, in becoming a head coach and being a part of a unit, period. Um, I think individuals on a sheet of paper um, can collectively look amazing on paper. Um, and I think Tamika hit on that. Sean, I think he, he really hit on that. Collectively on paper, we can be all stars on paper. But if personalities do not coincide, it can be an absolute disaster. Um, And that's actually what I want to touch on. I believe in what Tamika said. I believe in self-reflection. I I think you have to look at yourself as a leader and the head of the body. And you have to reflect on both the things that you did well and the things that you needed work on. Um, As we started to have small successes, I had to change my perception from a one in 26 coach and the coach that was taking over programs that to flip and move and flip. That had become a pattern for me. And when I finally got a caliber of assistant that on paper was technically what I should hire at that institution, that was not a good fit. So when I look back on things and I look at a self-reflection and we look at, you know, um, certain instances and situations, there's so many that came to mind um, from first year to last year, but the one thing that I, I definitely want to make sure um, that I know forward moving forward now, having been more, believe it or not, out of the game, I am closer to the women's basketball circle than I was in it. I didn't have time to do as much as I wanted to. And I didn't take the severity of what I needed to do while in the game. And now I've been able to do so. So the one thing I would put my one finger on would be people management, not necessarily just taking resumes, having these interviews here, legitimately the equation has to fit for the court to fit and for it to align with the institution. There are just some fundamentals that every institution has and non-negotiables. There's non-negotiables that every program and program leader has. It all has to mesh in alignment in order for your players um, to follow. And so I, I would start there and sort of leave it there for the season vets to, to put their impact in, input on things. Do we have any more insight anyone wants to share before we turn it back over to Kim? Thank you so much, Coach uh, Kern Hart for that input. And since we don't have no more questions, Kim, we'll turn it back over to you. Kim Hampton, Vice President of Women Basketball, Rising Coaches, DEI Alliance. Wow. Well, I really want to thank all of the panelists. All of your information was so incredible. I mean, it just seems that this is a snowball effect.
back. It gets better every time we do this. Can we come back again? And hopefully we will continue this. And now everyone knows what to look for. But I want to thank every coach for getting on. Um, I want to thank those that ask questions. Um, I definitely want to thank my DEI team because this has truly, truly been a blessing. It's been a blessing to me. I don't coach and I never wanted to coach. I had like a little short stint. So I want you guys to know what you do is incredibly important. I've always said that teachers and coaches have the most influence over a child's life, over a person's life outside of their families and sometimes even more so. So, um, you know, continue to grow. I'm so grateful that I have the opportunity to do this and to learn and to grow and to be here. And I thank Daryl for recruiting me to do this because at first I was kind of like, I don't, I don't know anything about coaches. What can I do? But you know, I understand that we are in this all together um, and it, it is time. It's time for us all to um, evaluate ourselves and it's time for us to all get better at what it is that we do. And it's time for us to give more and to give back to help make this world a better place. So again, I thank you all so, so very much. And I'm going to pass it over to Brian and we can just pass it on down the line back to Daryl. Yeah, we'll just say thank you so much. Uh, such an awesome panel, um, industry leaders, as Daryl said many times. So we just appreciate you all taking the time to open up and share and add value to all of us uh, this evening. And then we'll pass it to Daryl and to Adam. Well, I just want to thank the panel for coming on, particularly, um, you know, Coach Kern Huff, uh, Tamika Smith-Jones, and of course, Sean Halbrun for taking time out this evening to share your expertise. Um, again, and, and invaluable um, having this kind of interaction and this opportunity to be a part of Rising Coaches and what we do at the DEI Alliance. Um, so without further ado, I want to turn it over to the CEO of, of Rising Coaches, who always tells me not to acknowledge him, but without him giving us this platform and being out at the forefront in the leadership of DEI and what that is all about, um, Adam Gordon. Adam? Thanks, Daryl. Um, and thanks, Kim and, and Brian, for putting this together. You guys uh, we're, we're forever indebted to all your guys' hard work and organization and execution. It takes a lot putting these together. Uh, so just want to commend you guys on a, a fantastic job. And thank you to the panelists uh, for your wisdom and insight. It was fantastic. And thank you for the participants. Thank you, everybody, for, for spending a Tuesday night with us, uh, getting better and, and learning from, from uh, these great coaches and administrators that lent their time to us. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, I guess I'll leave you with this. If you are interested, we'll, we'll continue to do the Women's Empowerment Series. I think the plan is to do this quarterly. Um, so we will certainly continue to, to provide this uh, service for you guys. If you like this and you're interested in doing more of this, um, you can check out risingcoaches.com. We do have an annual membership where we, uh, where we do panels like this all the time. We have tons of content that we've built up over the course of the last 12 years. And, and uh, we do a lot to connect our members with each other and so that they build genuine relationships in the profession. And then we do a lot on the job front as well. And, and uh, we've been blessed and fortunate to uh, have a lot of people reach out to us when they need to make a hire. And so we relay that information straight to our members. So uh, would encourage you guys to check that out, risingcoaches.com, but, um, but really uh, just appreciate you guys being on here and we'll continue to uh, keep this women's empowerment series going as long as we can. Uh, I have a quick question, Adam, thank you. Uh, I know we're recording this. I've had a couple of coaches reach out to me and say that they couldn't log on today, but they really wanted to. Um, Will it be an opportunity for them to um, listen in or to see this? Yes. Great question, Kim. Um, it, is, uh, it is on our YouTube channel. So if they want to go back and anybody who didn't catch last night and wants to go back and catch last night, just head to our YouTube channel, Rising Coaches, uh, and it's on there for you guys to check out. And there's other free content on there as well and other DEI panels that we've done and uh, just other coaching Zooms and whatnot. So, yes. That's a great free resource. Good question, Kim. And thank you, Kim, for, for bringing, this was your vision. So uh, pr proud of you and, and uh, the team's execution to bring it to life. And thank you everybody for uh, joining us. And thank you guys. 
we'll see you guys next time. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Good night, all.